Good morning. You might be hoping today that I am focusing on a specific part of the reading. There are many really interesting parts. And you might be wondering, is she going to say something about the flesh thing? Or the weird lamb stuff? And the answer, the short answer is no. Um, I've, but in a way, what I have to say today might, might help you understand that a little better. Today, what has called to me is one passage. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For those of us staring down the barrel of student loan payments restarting, or some other form of financial debt, your first instinct in hearing this might be, yes. It seems like it would relieve a great deal of burdens to eschew financial debt. And to be fair, lots of other places in the Bible are specifically talking about not putting money above people. But this passage goes beyond this. Instead of it being a passage about what we do not owe, it is a passage about what we do owe. The truth is it would be so much easier to live in a world it is so much easier to live in a world of financial debt than one of social debt. Especially because our current structure of society is held together by financial exchanges. For instance, a member of my family finds it a lot easier to have their children cared for by someone they pay than by family. Because with someone you pay, the, the exchange is clear. I give you money, you keep my child safe, you keep my child healthy, you feed my child, whatever. But with family, it's a little bit harder because there are all the other relational factors involved. And you have to worry if something did happen to the child, even if it was an accident. It'd be a lot easier to write off the person you're paying than to write off your brother or your mother. It'd be a lot easier to be angry if it was someone you didn't love. Another maybe more relatable example is how we would rather go and get a pedicure from someone we pay than show up for the Maundy Thursday service, <laughs> right? It's so just a little bit easier when the interaction is, a, is contractually associated with money. And the debt of love is at once easier and harder. For one thing, regardless of your circumstances or your context or your privilege or your disabilities, we all have an equal capacity to love. Our ability to love one another is the greatest, most equitable resource. And also to truly love one another, to truly act in that love, is enormously difficult. In a way, unlike money, we are unable to quantify. And we so want to quantify our resources. The numbers and the finite nature of most resources are a comfort to us. They are controllable and they provide the illusion of security. I'm not saying we shouldn't have a balanced budget, but that doesn't guarantee anything for us. We can know how much money we have or don't have, but we can't know how much love we have. It is riskier and more nuanced and more complicated to owe a debt of love. A friend of mine once suggested that we as a society use the word love too much. And I think when he was saying that, he was thinking about how we say, I love my car, or I love my sweater, and not so much that we need to say that we love each other less. But it was that moment that made me realize that we really do not use the word love enough. 
It's easy to say we love our family or we love our romantic partner. But it's harder for me or for you to come to each other here in this space and say, I love you and I love you. And not to say we love you, but I love you, to really take ownership of that. It's scary and difficult. But in reality, Jesus calls us to use love in that way. To use that word love for each and every person we encounter. Not just the people we know, not even just the people we like, but everybody. It's not a request. It isn't a pleasant platitude. It isn't positive and polite. It's a debt. It is truly what we owe God and one another. You're probably aware by now that Jesus, more often than not, is pretty vague in his stories and in his sayings. The kingdom of heaven, for example, never really gives a straight answer about what that's like. That's where we get most of our parables. He can even talk in circles about who he is. But not today. Today he is painstakingly specific. He gives a step-by-step guide for what to do when you are in conflict with your community. Step one is eerily similar to our feedback initiative. You know, I wrote a sermon for last week's service because I was a little bit confused about the schedule and I didn't realize that Scott was preaching. But it was good practice. And Scott did a great job, of course. And I was not needed. But that sermon, too, was about the feedback initiative. As was my sermon three weeks ago. It's kind of important. Because to me, I see what we do here as building community and the core of community is right communication. And it's not just important to me or to Nat or Jeff or Rachel or Jordan or the numerous other people who have made it happen. We need to be able to work in our community of God towards being who God has called us to be. That is a community of love, indebted in love, not without conflict, but able to engage with and heal from conflict, to be made better by conflict. And the first step of that in this gospel and in the feedback initiative is to start a conversation. Conversation colored by love, motivated by inclusion, service, discovery, and gratitude. All of which are very much a part of the feedback initiative and very much a part of the goals of this church. If they sound familiar, it's because they are your core values. Stated on your banners, mostly on the website right now, but hopefully we'll put them up all over the walls. I don't know. You guys do what you want with that. But. Jesus then goes on to say that if an initial conversation is pr- isn't productive, you should go to the community of believers for help. Not as some kind of tribunal or punishment, but in an effort to bring clarity and new perspective. Where two minds cannot solve a problem, three or four might. I once had a coworker at L'Arche, where I used to work. This is, L'Arche is an intentional spiritual community that provides housing and care for adults with intellectual disabilities. Me and this coworker, we did not get along. We were bad communicators, at least with each other, because of small slights that built up over time. Not even real slights. We created a narrative in our heads about each other, about our motivations and opinions that were untrue. And when you are a caregiver for others in this nature, as a part of a team, you have to communicate. It's literally life or death. So finally, things reached ahead, and we were directed to mediation, or at least That's the word they used, but the first step was not mediation. The first step was just the two of them. My understanding of mediation involves 
is step two of what Jesus is suggesting. So we met, and that was good because we had not yet had a time to talk about our relationship, to talk about what was really going on. If we had not figured it out in that conversation, we would have eventually had true mediation. But the reality was we didn't. When we met, we aired our grievances and our hurt, we explained ourselves, and finally we came up with a plan. We found that due to our upbringing, we had very different expectations of feedback. I wanted feedback immediately and clearly. I wanted to know right away how I could do better. He preferred to have time before receiving feedback. For him, immediate feedback felt like an attack. It felt like a punishment. And we were both under an undue amount of pressure and stress. So we started checking in before each time that we worked together to see how we were feeling that day and to understand that if someone was being a little short or distracted, that it wasn't because of the other person but because they were having a bad day, or they didn't sleep well last night, or maybe they were in a fight with their parents, you know, those kinds of things. And we spent that time, that time spent understanding where the other person was at emotionally took a lot of the bite out of our interactions. And we agreed to change how we gave each other feedback. And over a surprisingly short amount of time, he became one of my dearest friends. A friendship that has lasted over six years, which is a lot, given that he lives on the other coast, and we don't work together anymore, and we are millennials. Some commentators, um, so I'm, when I prepare for a sermon, I like to read a commentary. Commentary is an assessment of a reading written by a biblical scholar, a theologian, somebody who understands the larger context of the reading and interpret it, interprets it. And this helps me because I like to know where I'm at in the story and I'm not great with memorizing the Bible. So the commentary for this gospel suggested that Jesus might not have really said this part. As I mentioned, it isn't his usual parabolic way of speaking. And the commentator almost had me convinced that this was maybe added by Matthew's community that needed a guideline for how to deal with their own conflict. There are two reasons, however, I think Jesus did say this. Firstly, we only really know how Jesus usually talks in Matthew's Gospel at the word of Matthew's Gospel. Maybe this is just, this is the one thing that Jesus really did say and all the other stuff were additions. We can't know, and that's the reality of faith. We cannot know, but we can choose to believe. And I choose to believe this passage not because I never doubt anything in the Bible. On the contrary, I am convinced that doubt is essential to faith. I choose to believe because I have seen the miracle that this process can yield. That in participating in this open and honest form of communication in community, I was able to love more and to be more loved in that way, it is very much in keeping with what Jesus has said before and what he would continue to say in this gospel and in the others. The other reason I believe Jesus said this is actually one reason that the commentator thinks he didn't. They suggested that Jesus saying to treat the offender as if they were a Gentile or tax collector is contrary to Jesus' message. You see, it sounds like he's saying, dismiss this person out of community. 
Write them off. They're not one of us anymore. But Jesus was pretty big into hanging out with tax collectors. And not three weeks ago, we heard the story of how a Gentile woman convinced him that this salvation, this was earned by her people, by her faith. That that faith included them. So it could be further evidence of Matthew's gospel contradicting itself. Or it could be a reminder that we are never to write anyone off. Or entirely and without recourse exclude someone from the community. That if someone refuses to hear what needs to change for the better of the community, we keep trying. We keep showing up for them and we keep engaging it with them. And that's the kind of love we owe one another. To never give up on the community. To never give up on love. To continuously strive towards better communication for the sake of the kingdom of God. So usually, as I wrap up the sermon, I ask for you to, view, for you to do a task. It's usually pretty general. And it has something to do with love. And today is no different. But I'm going to be a bit more specific. As you move into this time of transition, and you might feel a little unmoored, I ask that you think about someone else in this parish that you don't know well, or at all. Or maybe you do know them and you don't like them. And I want you to have coffee with them, or lunch, or drinks, if that's your thing. And learn their story. Because the best way to avoid the miscommunication that happens so often in a community is to know one another better. So that might seem like a big ask, so maybe I'll be a little bit more specific. Maybe start with a staff member or a ministry leader. Somebody for whom maybe you have been asking something of and you don't really know anything about them. It, it might change the way you view this community. I'm very much going to miss you all and I will be praying for all of you and for this community. But I don't have any worries about y'all. Because you have so much love. And you'll take care of each other. Amen.